third source of sirah is books written specifically for sirah. And the first people to begin writing books of sirah were the sons of the Sahaba, the Sahaba's children. Can you imagine if your father was a Sahabi and he's telling you all of these stories of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and there's so many, you begin to write them down. And of the greatest of those who wrote was Urwa, the son of Zubayr. Urwa, the son of Zubayr. Urwa is the son of the Sahabi, the grandson of the Sahabi. His mother is a Sahabiya. His grandmother is a Sahabiya. His brother is a Sahabi, but he was born after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he's not a Sahabi. His brother is even a Sahabi, but he's not a Sahabi. And his aunt is Aisha. His aunt is Aisha, the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Urwa is one of the primary narrators of hadith and fiqh and tafsir and of sirah. Because he has access to Aisha. Nobody had access to Aisha. He has, he's a mahram. Aisha doesn't need to wear hijab in front of him. So Urwa is the primary narrator from Aisha. And lots of details of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam come from Urwa. Because Aisha tells him those details. And it is said that Urwa wrote a small pamphlet of the sirah. Also, the son of Uthman ibn Affan, his name was Abban, Abban ibn Uthman ibn Affan, the son of Uthman ibn Affan, he died 105 Hijrah, he also wrote a little booklet of Sirah. And some other booklets were written, until finally a great scholar came by the name of Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri, Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri, who died 129 Hijrah, and he wrote one of the first early treatises of Sirah. Now, none of these books has existed, none of them, anymore. We simply have references in later books of these earlier books. Why aren't they existent? Very, very simple reason. When later books came, they absorbed the earlier treatises. So, Abban is saying, my father told me, my father told me, my father told me. Urwa is saying, Aisha narrated, my father narrated, my uncle narrated, three, four people. Imagine somebody comes and he takes Abban and Urwa and other books, and then he says, let me make a bigger book. Once the bigger book is written, who needs Urwa and who needs Abban anymore, right? You might as well copy that book. And realize in those days, there were no printing presses. In those days, if you wanted a book, what would you do? You would sit there and write it yourself cover to cover. So if you had to choose one book, you would choose the bigger ones. You would choose the ones with more details. And so it's a sad case for us now. We wish we had those early books, but unfortunately we don't have them. But we do have books that were written in the very next generation, very early. And this shows us that Sira was compiled by and large even before Hadith, by and large, because they wanted to emphasize Sira more than anything else. And the greatest, I'm being very simplistic here because obviously we can go, where well, there's lots of PhDs written about sources of Sirah. I'm summarizing in a short sentences. The greatest scholar of Sirah is a name most of you would have heard of, Ibn Ishaq. Sirat Ibn Ishaq. Ibn Ishaq. His name is Muhammad Ibn Ishaq and he was born around 85 Hijrah. Now think about it, 85 Hijrah. Which means he's living in Medina. He's born in Medina. Right? This is where the Prophet lived and died. This is where the children of the Sahaba are. He grew up around the children of the Sahaba and the grandchildren of the Sahaba. 85 Hijrah is very early, right? And the Sahaba lived up until around 100, 110 Hijrah. You know, Jab and others, they died 90 Hijrah. So, Muhammad ibn Ishaq, or ibn Ishaq for short, he met the sons of the Sahaba. Maybe even he saw some of the Sahaba. Maybe. But it's very early. 85 Hijrah is when he's born. is very early. And he began writing everything that he heard. And he just had a passion for the seerah. So he began writing everything and began compiling it in chronological order. Unlike the earlier treatises, they weren't in chronological order. Ibn Ishaq began saying, well, this happened in early Mecca, and this middle Mecca, this late Mecca, then the Hijrah, and then he got, so he compiled a very large book. And just to be on the safe side, he even traveled to other cities where some of the Sahaba had went, Basra, Kufa. He went and traveled there to discover the stories of Ibn Mas'ud, who traveled to Kufa, to, to the, the stories of uh, the Sahaba who traveled to other places in the world. So he traveled to other lands as well, but his primary source was always in Medina. And one of the best things about Muhammad ibn Ishaq is he compiled everything with the chain of narrators. What is the chain of narrators called in Islam? Isnad. Isnad. Isnad is the chain of narrators. The chain of narrators is a uniquely Islamic phenomenon. It does not exist in any other religion or culture. It's a uniquely Islamic phenomenon. And the chain of narrators tells us where the story came from. Because in Islam, we always wanted to verify authenticity. We didn't just base our religion on superstitions and fables. Who told you this? Who told you that? Who told him that? Who told him that? All the way back to the Prophet So we compile the narrators. Ibn Ishaq from so-and-so, from so-and-so, from so-and-so. Back to the son of Jabir, from Jabir, from the Prophet So we have a whole Islam. And we know every person, when he was born, when he died, how, how good was he of a Muslim? Was he a good memory? Or was he a poor memory? And therefore we can judge the Islam. And so the Prophet uh, uh, Ibn Ishaq began compiling the life of the Prophet وسلم, And he wrote a massive book. It was so big. It was, they said it was in... 10, 15 volumes. And this is in, and he died, Ibn Ishaq died 150 Hijrah. So he lived from 85 to 150, very early on. It was so big that it was difficult to copy. And so one of his uh, students, if you like, came along, not a direct student, a student of a student, and his name was Ibn Hisham. These are two names most Muslims are aware of. Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Hisham, right? And Ibn Hisham, his name was Abdul Malik Ibn Hisham. Abdul Malik Ibn Hisham. And Ibn Hisham died 213 Hijrah. Now the reason why I'm going into detail here is that the average Muslim should be aware of these two source books of the seal, Ibn Ishaq and Ibn Hisham, right? I know this is not directly the Sira, we'll get there, but you need to know some books. Where does the Sira come from? Primarily, the number one source is Ibn Ishaq and then Ibn Hisham. Now, what's the difference between Ibn Hisham and Ibn Ishaq? Very simple. Ibn Hisham realized that Ibn Ishaq is too big, 10, 12 volumes. So, he decided to summarize it. Ibn Hisham did not add anything he subtracted. He did not rearrange, he deleted. Ibn Hisham simply cut, 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 cut. Lots of cuts he made. And he made it into, now Ibn Hisham is available in four volumes. I have an edition, four volumes, let's say. So, they say he made it maybe into a half or a third of the original size. 
Now, somebody will say, why did he do that? Why didn't he leave it a large book? We need to realize in those days, they didn't have printing press. If you wanted the book, you'd have to write it cover to cover. And he realized this was too much detail. And also one of the things of Ibn Ishaq, he was one of the first people to write a history of humanity. He began from Adam. He worked his way down. Ibrahim, uh, Nuh, Ibrahim, Musa, and then he made his way to the Prophet. And Ibn, Ibn Hisham said, you know what? We don't need all of this. Let's begin with the life and times of the Prophet. So he deleted the entire section about early history. And he deleted a lot of other information that he felt was not that uh, not that useful. And so over time, people began copying Ibn Hisham. And if you want to buy a copy of the book, you have to buy Sirat Ibn Hisham. You're not going to find Sirat. Which one? Ibn Ishaq. You're not going to find that. Okay, you're not going to find that because it is now gone missing. However, just a side point for the little bit more interested in those amongst you. There was a very, very famous scholar, Indian, <laughs> by the name of Dr. Hamidullah. Dr. Hamidullah, very famous scholar. And he lived a very ripe old age, around 93. He just passed away five years ago, six years, no, actually a little bit, six, seven years ago. And he, he was from India, and then he went to France. And he became one of the greatest scholars uh, in what we call Orientalism, or, or you know, it's a specializing studying of Islam amongst non-Muslims. He wrote book, uh, notebooks in French and in English, and he became a great researcher. And Dr. Hamidullah discovered many manuscripts. A lot of these manuscripts ended up in Berlin, in Paris, in London. Now, how could ancient manuscripts end up over there? Many reasons. Of them is colonialism. When the West came, and they started purchasing art items and they started purchasing ancient things. They have the money, they have the political power. And so the sad fact of the matter is some of the most earliest Qurans, we find them in Paris. The earliest Mus'haf that we have is in Paris. And another early Mus'haf is in London. And so on and so forth. So this is just the reality of the state of our ummah, that when they left, they took all of these treasures with them. Some of them were purchased, some of them were literally just taken by force. So after World War One, after all of this, there's a lot of manuscripts. Uh, and it's not just World War I. I mean, to be fair, a lot of them were purchased. So people, when you have pounds, sterling, or American dollars, people are willing to sell items, you know, and so a lot of these items were purchased by rich businessmen who just valued it as art, so lots of manuscripts, and to this day, by the way, the majority of early ancient manuscripts are found in, let's say, Germany, one of the most largest repositories of manuscripts are in Germany, because Germans had an interest in Islam in the 18th century, so Hamidullah is obviously a Muslim, he reads fluent Arabic and whatnot, so he's going through all of these treasures in Germany, in Paris, in London, and he discovered a lot of manuscripts, one of the manuscripts he discovered was a partial copy of Ibn Ishaq. The Ummah had thought Ibn Ishaq is missing and gone. The Ummah had thought, Khalas, there is no more Ibn Ishaq. He discovered around one-fourth of Ibn Ishaq. And so he edited it and published it. And when now we compare, this is why it's good to have the earlier sources, because then we can show the people, look, Ibn, Ibn Hisham didn't just invent Sirah. He's taking it from Ibn Ishaq. So when he compared Ibn Ishaq with Ibn Hisham, he found that exactly as Ibn Hisham said, he simply cut off around half or around one-third. He just cut off. What did he cut off? Long poetry, uh, the lineage of the Arabs. So every time Ibn Ishaq would mention a name, he'd take him back to, let's say, Nuh, alayhi salam. Okay? Lineage of 50, 60 people. So Ibn Hisham goes, look, you know what? Let's just go back four or five people, cut the rest off. So when he compared the two, he found, yes, Ibn Hisham was accurate in what he did. And therefore, we can now say, alhamdulillah, for sure, when we read Ibn Hisham, we're reading something written around 100 years after the Prophet ﷺ passed away. Amazing. Well, it's amazing. Far before any book of hadith. Because Bukhari died 256, Muslim died uh, 261, and so on and so forth. So Ibn, Ibn uh, Ishaq died 150. He wrote the book around 130 or so. So literally around 100 years after the death of the Prophet ﷺ, a little bit more than 100, we have the majority of the bulk of Ibn Ishaq preserved through Ibn uh, Hisham. So uh, the third source of Sirah is the books specifically written for the Sirah. 